Welcome to season two of the Shopstool podcast, a podcast for woodworkers and the maker community in general. With Joey Chalk from King Post Timberworks, Brian Cush from Sawdust Bureau, and Robin Lewis from Robin Lewis Makes. Hi everyone, I hope you're all very well. This is episode 37, season two of the Shopstool podcast. And as I'm sure you've seen by the title already, it is the final episode of season two of the Shop Still podcast. So in a tradition which has been unbroken for all 37 episodes, I'm going to start by introducing my two co-hosts. Joey, how are you? Very good. How are you, Robin? Not too bad, thanks. And Brian, how's it going? Um, great, Robin. How are you? Yes, I'm very, very well. Thank good. you. And yes, you're, my name you're, is Robin. You're like, a, you're like a child the last day of school. You sound excited. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, for everyone listening, we, we normally shoot this, well, we record this podcast a little bit later in the evening, and um, so we're an hour earlier today, and as much as I've just come straight off my day job, I actually feel, I'm still, like, I'm, I'm not buggered, it's not the end of the day tired, you know, so I do have a bit more, a bit more buzz. Um, so, yeah, this is going to be the last episode of season two, and we thought what we'd do is touch on the year that we've had, and then talk about what's coming up in the next the next year. It's it's the end of the year, so we're coming up to Christmas. It's a good time to take a take a bit of a break. We are going to be taking a short break. Um, we haven't decided for how long yet, but we will be taking a bit of a, sh- a break, a bit of a holiday, um, and then we'll come back for season three after this. Um, sometime in the new of, year. Sometime in the new year. Yeah. yeah. There's a, a couple of reasons around this. Obviously, the first one is Christmas is coming up. And I don't know about you guys, but like Christmas in our family is big. Like they, you don't work over Christmas. No. Um, I take my holiday over Christmas. We, we celebrate Christmas. Um, but also uh, on top of that, I've got a, my second child is coming along. Well, and yeah. It was um, um, four weeks away yesterday. Right. So TikTok. It's, yeah, it's, 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 it's coming up. So pretty good Christmas present. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to be focusing on that in the beginning of the year. Yeah, and, absolutely. And um, yeah, it just seemed like the right time to, to bring it to an, an end. Awesome. Yeah. Because it has been a long year. It's absolutely. been a very, very, very long year. You know, you just made me think of something before, um, completely off topic, but when you said you used to like not work on Christmas and have the big celebration, mm. when I was a teenager, when I was like 100% into skateboarding, um, Christmas was the best day of the year. You'd get up early, run out the door, and go into the city with the skateboard, and you could skate all the spots. Empty city. You could could never (laughs) skate. There was no security. You could get a good couple of hours on all the spots. You'd only get 30 seconds on, and um, it was awesome. So that was Mm. was the day to go and destroy some stuff. And so that's your yeah. Christmas Day sorted this year, then, Joey, is it? Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> do you do you ever still go, go out skating? I, I, every now and then, like now, my boy's five and he's he's got a, a little skateboard and um, mm. he he just wants to be able to do the tricks at the moment and he just gets frustrated, so mm. it doesn't last too long. Uh, right now, he's above me playing skateboarding on Xbox, so you might hear that. Um, yeah. So he knows all the tricks. But he just he doesn't want to put in the time right now to actually learn how to do them. Just fair enough. Because yeah. <laughs> it's hard for a five year old to grasp that it's gonna take you five years to get really good. So mm. <laughs> five years and many broken bones. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. just push forward, back, forward, back, A B, A, B. No, exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Up, down, up, down, X. Bam. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Brian, how about you? Is Christmas Because uh, I guess no, you're going to be back in Melbourne for Christmas. Yeah, right? so I'm actually going to be back in Melbourne. We arrived back, although Air New Zealand very kindly cancelled our flight and said, oh, we'll get you on the one the next day. And I'm like, well, we're supposed to be flying on Christmas Eve, so that means you're going to fly us on Christmas Day. What? So, yeah. Did they just cancel it? Because you were meant yeah. to be going on the 23rd or something. The 24th originally, and oh, now right. we're going on the... So we're going on the 23rd now. Oh, jeez. But, yeah, yeah, it took a... I mean, they were just cool as anything oh yeah christmas day oh. sorry <laughs> no i didn't even know um, planes flew on christmas day yeah usually get pretty cheap fares on christmas day but um mm. uh what can you do it's it's fine it gives us a day earlier but um yeah it's gonna be hard because normally i would spend christmas in new zealand with my kiwi family over here mm. but uh yeah we've got 
brothers and sisters to get back to in Melbourne who we haven't seen for quite a long time now. Right. So um, that was part of the deal. Uh, never mind. Yeah, it'll be it'll be really nice to get back. I am mm. thoroughly missing the workshop right now. Yeah, I'll bet. Um, yeah. I've in decided that being a full-time dad is way harder than being a full-time furniture maker. <laughs> <laughs> in crazy. terms of the, the process of getting home, what's yep. involved? Do you need to do at another... The min- at the minute, it's pretty simple. So there's no quarantine. New Zealand's part of the, mm. um, the quarantine-free travel bubble with Australia. Mm. Um, there's been a few glitches, obviously, in the last few weeks in yep. South Australia and New South Wales, but um, it's looking pretty positive. Uh, mm. If they tell us last minute that we're going to have to um, quarantine over Christmas Day oh and New Year's Day, I think we might just end up staying in New Zealand for a couple of weeks, but hopefully that doesn't happen. But if it does, I'll, I'll come up, spend spend a few days up in the Bay of Islands. It won't be that bad, Joy. Yeah. Yeah. You know. but, um, no, all, all looking pretty positive at the minute. And, yeah, great to see Melbourne finally returning to some sense of normality again yeah. you know, the mask mandate has sort of been eased off of it. I was never I never really had a problem with wearing masks but coming into the summer wearing a mask on a 40 degree day outside in a public park or in a beach amazing it yeah. was going to feel like a drag um, yeah. but no that's all that's all gone so I think it's just wear them indoor shopping centres and that is it so it's great news and it, yeah and it's amazing to be set, you know talking about the year that's 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 gone it's amazing to be sitting here saying that because Mm. our first episode on the coronavirus was i'm trying to think back to when it was it feels like just yesterday yeah it it feels like just the other day would have been cracking over my podcast after seeing it was but it would have been i'm guessing mid-april was it i guess it was which is just it's just crazy because it yeah it felt like um just yesterday and it was such a depressing show <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I mean, we were all doom and gloom about the end of the world and um mm. it's funny like some things turned out far but like for me obviously having a child this year has meant that i've got to spend a lot more time with him yeah but mm. we were worrying about issues that have come to fruition stuff that mm. we were talking about off the show joey like hardware yeah. Now becoming problem like I've been trying to order some um, box making hinges from the UK. You know they had stock of them. I ordered them three months ago. I got a note two weeks ago, so like two and a half months, and they're like, "Oh no, our supplier has gone bankrupt." Um, oh. wow. so, so like there's things like that that are happening that we sort of predicted and price hikes with with yeah. um, materials, but I don't think any of us could have predicted the idea of being banned from being in a workshop for nearly three months in in um, Metropolitan no, Melbourne like that that's is a strange one eh, isn't it? it it feels like oh, it feels like an eternity ago but um, yeah the fact that that happened is just bizarre yeah yeah like we've got I just got an email from my main timber supplier and all timber is going up 10 to 20 percent Depending on, depending on species. Um, and have a lot of so unhappy clients. All the American stuff's gone up almost 20%. Mm-hmm. Um, I got notifications from uh, Blum, New Zealand, telling me their main line of draw runners are pretty much no longer available. Um, <sighs> only like all the common sizes that you always use for kitchens and cabinetry, they're pretty much out of stock. And my other supplier just up the road from me have having similar issues with the regular size, the 150 mil high draw runners. Um, they're pretty much all gone. Um, there's is that issues. an issue of getting them into New Zealand, or do you yeah. think it's a factory issue in? Uh, it seems to be getting them in. They keep telling us that the companies are still running in Europe that mm-hmm. are producing these things. Um, the problem seems to be that there's far less boats wanting to come to New Zealand because of regulations with the quarantining and the changing of mm-hmm. the shift changing mm-hmm. of stuff, which is made difficult here. Well, difficult for them. It, it's not so straightforward, and they've got to essentially pay their, their guys for quarantine time, which it doesn't, they don't seem to want to do. 
So we're having less boats come uh, to us, which means um, yeah, getting your stuff on the boat seems to be um, you know, difficult. And I've heard kind of anecdotally that it seems to be whoever wants to pay the most is getting their, their shipment on the boat. And they're like taking shipments off and putting others on in place, wow. depending on depending on who wants to pay more for it. <laughs> so, Jeez, it's like trying to get a shopping. flight out of out of Europe or the states yeah. into Australia or something. They just bump the economy and let yeah. the business class. It's funny yeah, you said it. I hadn't thought about them bumping cargo off. I just thought there was a backlog. But before well, I left Melbourne, yeah. I posted the exact same piece of furniture: one to Wellington in New Zealand and one to Ireland. Yeah. And the one in Ireland arrived three days before the one in Wellington. Yeah. Which is mad. The boats, at the moment, I, I was just drove through Auckland City a couple of days ago, and out in the harbour there's three massive um, container, shipping container boats. Welcome to season two. Well, there he is. <laughs> there's there's that, three no? mis- big boats sitting out in the harbour um, just waiting to get to a dock uh, uh, because uh, the, the, there's also shortages of and time constraints with what the, the port workers have to do now. It takes longer to offload the boats. And there's something like a 20 day, uh, 20 day delay getting stuff, oh, getting right. the containers off the boats. And so the boats are just queuing up. And uh, yeah, pretty crazy. In terms of the positives this year though, Joey, like so it, your work has obviously changed a bit and it's allowed you to take on bigger projects with that were maybe higher risk things that in normal years you would say, oh, I've got this, you know, I've got four kitchens lined up. Yeah. I know how long it's going to take me to make a kitchen. I know the profit margin on it. No thanks, crazy spiral stairs that are going to yeah. occupy my life for four months. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're right. You know, and we, and we touched on it in the last episode, but those steps, we just sat and talked about it, the feasibility of it, should I even do it? And... Uh, the COVID thing happened right at the same time, like when I was initially thinking about it. Um, and I kind of said yes to it and, and everything kind of, everything kind of went away. I like never heard from them because of the virus and stuff. And then it suddenly just came back and I was like, oh shit, I'm doing the stairs. Um, but it was good timing because work had kind of dried up a bit and it, um, like I've been very, I've been really busy after COVID, after we were allowed to, get back into the workshop. I've been super busy. Um, it's just been nice and steady. Busier, way busier than I thought we would be um, relative to our last conversation on it. Um, Do you feel as though that's, like, I personally feel as though that's going to go well into 2021 as well in terms of, because importation of stuff from uh, Asia and Europe and America is going to be on huge delays that people are going to be commissioning us to do work that we maybe necessarily wouldn't have had the chance to quote for because we would have been too expensive. Yeah, that's a good uh, point. Um, Yeah, I feel like I haven't thought about it in that way, but I think, I mean, my my work, um, the kind of, yeah, I do such oddball work like I'll do like a spiral staircase and then I'll do a kitchen. Like I, there's not many people that does just, it's just such a crazy range of stuff. And so for me, oddball jobs is normal. But I think, yeah, there probably will be an increase of slightly uh, slightly off oddball work coming in that, and there'll probably be more of it. So it won't be just me doing it. It'll be uh, other guys. I imagine guys like kitchen makers will probably start branching out and not necessarily just doing kitchens, and they've probably already mm-hmm. started doing that. Um, but I think there will be some issues with hardware, and I think that's going to be yeah. a major problem with, um, well, for people who are used to just using, like, steel-sided kitchen drawer runners, that could be a problem for how they move forward. Uh, I can make a drawer in 10 different ways, so I'm not too worried. But, um, yeah, I think yeah, there, there could be some issues with, if, you know, you need a hinge, you need a hinge, and if it's not there, then you've got to start thinking quite outside the box. Just do like old Neil did in one of his recent videos and make it out of wood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so, yeah. We were, I was just going through the 
the, the episodes, the, the history of the episodes. So, Brian, did you, were you on the episode with us with Nick Padula? Nick Padula? No. Okay. Now, that makes sense. I don't remember. So, Joey, you and I must have done the, the podcast together, just the two of us. The start of the for, season. It was just us, I think. For one, two, three, four, five, seven episodes. Yeah, because then on, in, uh, on episode eight, that's where you joined, Brian. That was right. in October, October 2019. 19. Wow. Yeah. So we've done over what, a year. 28, 28, 28 and just over a year. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. It's yeah, been really so good. Like, again, looking at the positive things to come out of COVID, the fact that, like, we'll generally be consumed talking about what we're doing ourselves in the workshop, but it's allowed mm. us to talk to people on a more regular basis and especially dealing in kind of crisis mode, how people have morphed and, and um, branched out from their, their core business into other fields, like... Thinking back to, I think Neil from Discommon was one of the first guys, you know, and mm. yeah, yeah, with the was, masks was, in South Carolina, yeah. and then you sort of follow him to where he is at today, and he's gone f like firmly back into the luxury goods market. Like, right. I think he sold out. He released a bag today that he had been working on for, I don't even know. I think it's about two years, and uh, they sold out fifty grand's worth of bags in twenty four hours today. Jesus! Wow! So. It's just, it's mental how things just turn around. But, um, yeah, I've really enjoyed the the, um, the chance to sit down and talk to so sort of many really good makers, especially in Australia, and see how they're coping. Um, mm. It's been yeah, quite it's been funny because really we, the first uh, guest that we interviewed, the three of us, was Adam Markowitz, mm -hmm. who at the time I didn't know too much about. Obviously, you know, did a bit of research on him. But it's amazing how all the subsequent guests all know Adam. No, yeah. Adam's, Adam's, like, Adam's a man, yeah. Yeah, he's a, he's a common theme amongst so many of the stories. <laughs> um, you know, after Adam, it was Neil. Yep. Because that was a really awesome episode. And then, then we did um, uh, COC. Yep, yep. Um, Audi and RV. And then we started getting onto people like Aidan McKinnon from Cutthroat Knives. And was he, was he connected to Adam Markowitz? Um, I don't think uh, Aiden. I met at an awards night years ago, and I've just kept in touch. Okay. And um, I don't know whether he knows Adam that well, but okay. I mean, everybody knows Adam through. It's like two degrees of separation. It, you, it you'll, feels you'll, like that. You'll yeah, know. Yeah, uh, you'll know Margaret's, but um, but yeah, it's been fun to talk to people from like you know knife makers and people in different uh, different trades as well. Mm. I've gone back to Jem uh, from Like Butter. Mm -hmm. A number of times since I interviewed, that was episode 25, gone yeah. back a number of times to him and been like, dude, I've got this problem. You know, you deal with plywood. Yeah. What's, the best, what's the best way to do it? And it's one of the, the coolest things with interviewing these people is you just expand your, your, your network, but your knowledge. Yep. And it's been so, and all the people that we've had on the show have been those types of people where I feel like I could reach out and... Probably the only person I wouldn't would be Neil, but that's just because he's so, he's so busy and like yeah. in, a, in, in another on another planet. Yeah. But everyone else is open for conversation. Yeah, no, it's, it is one of the nice things about our industry that there is a willingness to share, and um, nobody's too secretive about what they do. Like there's a mutual level of respect, and it's it's really it's really nice. Would you guys say you have a favourite episode, or is that are we gonna? Oh. Are we going to make some enemies asking that question? <coughs> so we had Nick, Nick Pledge. Was, um, it, was it Burn who um, was stopped and got another beer halfway through? No, Damien. Oh, Damien, that was right. Damien, yeah. That was oh, a really cool one. Yeah, yeah that Damien. Was really cool. That was just that's so classic. He just talked. That it was a pretty good interview. Although I think for me, my favourite probably was Burn, just yeah. because... I've been following him for a bit, and I was like, "This is such a legendary, legendary dude." It was, it was pretty yeah. cool to talk to him, um, and again, he just knows what he's talking about. So that's what makes mm. it more special, I think. And then we did the the episode with Laura, um, and I don't know if we ever talked about this, but to everyone listening, that so that was episode twenty eight where we interviewed Laura McCusker. The episode before that, we had had a 
a chat afterwards and we would sort of said, you know, this, this, the way we're doing the shows, the format, it's getting a little bit long in the tooth. Let's try and jazz things up. So I came up with this cool intro where I was going to put Laura on the spot <laughs> and ask her a really difficult question immediately. And as it was coming out of my mouth, my brain was just going, this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work. <laughs> and it just... It just bombed and shame. In her defense, she took it like a champ and she worked with it, but we never did it like that again. I don't know if you guys noticed the next week we yeah, just went back it to did it. Yeah. <laughs> it did revert. I said something like... It was some oh, big story about a tool or something. You, you've come into the workshop, one of your... Uh, all of your tools have been... No, no, no. Your favorite tool has been stolen. Yeah, it's right. time to claim on insurance. What is that tool? Yeah, which was just a really stupid way of saying, what's your favorite tool? <laughs> but, yeah. Um, oh, then we okay, had... Maybe, maybe you can introduce a few segments into next year. Yeah, but I'd, yeah, still, well, I'd still really like to keep going. And, and, like, there's so many really great Australian makers out there as well that we haven't mm. spoken to yet. Like, um, I think... Did we touch briefly on the, the Wood Review Awards? Or maybe we didn't last week. But um, Simeon Ducks, who's right. based in Melbourne, was obviously the winner for a fabulous cabinet. And um, uh, Alexandra as well um, won the runner... I think she was runner-up in the furniture category. And she's also based in Melbourne. So I think mm. I'll be reaching out to them and trying to get yeah. them on the show. Cause that cabinet of... I thought it was Simon and Simeon. Um, Simeon, yep. Yeah. Yeah. That is so stunning. I remember when he finished it quite a long time ago actually yep. um, and I was like man that is one of those pieces where it's like yep he's captured it he's just got it right yeah mm. now he does some phenomenal work um, he I think it was during lockdown or maybe in between lockdowns in Melbourne um, Adam Markowitz had designed a piece but he was too busy with his architecture jobs that um, he got something to make it it's really beautiful. If you go on, I think it's on both their Instagrams, but if you go on Simeon Ducks, um, he's got a few different views of it. It's a really cool sort of freestanding cabinet type screen sort of all morphed into one with shelves. It's really, really beautiful, but um, thoroughly deserving of the, the 2020 Maker yeah. of the Year, I think. Um, so, yeah, it's it's cool. So we'll, we'll try to get him on, but I'm yeah. always open as well. I think, you know, it's good to reach out to the odd international but um i think it's it's really key to focus on the the local guys the kiwis and aussies yeah. that are mm. that are doing some world-class work it's also a lot harder i think i think we got very lucky with neil and um audi and rv mm -hmm. that it just that we were able to work around them because you know they were the first international and i think they were probably the last yeah um, we um i spoke to john peters this yeah, about getting him on the show, and we just couldn't we couldn't line it up because yeah. of that because of that time difference, and it's all I think it's always going to be a problem. But maybe um, but maybe COVID did make that easier because people's commitments changed. You know, they were more yeah. open to staying yeah. up late or getting up early and doing the show from from the other side of the world. You know, when we were talking, at some point we talked about mm. COVID and how there'd be this massive rush on home desks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. yeah, yeah. I've really only just got my first um, kind of inquiry about a desk, but it's so specific. You would, I mean, I can't really go into the craziness of what this person wants, but it's like the most specific customized craziness of a home desk. Like, <laughs> it's like Sorry, a Sorry, why can't you go into the... Oh, the... it's just, well, it's so specific that I, can't, I don't even think I could explain it. Because uh, I've only I just I, met her a couple of nights ago to to, to kind of and I'm still rack, wrapping my head around exactly what she wants and I'm trying to form all these elements into one project and make it do like ten th different things that she wants this desk to do, so um, um, I'm still trying to work out. But it's is it going to be very interesting, um, a very interesting build. But I've still got to work out how to draw it up. <laughs> So, but yeah, that's actually, it's funny. That's my only desk that's really come from COVID. Yeah, I got but, zero desks. Yeah. Because almost immediately there was a lot of pop-up, um, and good on them too, like either laser cut ply or even yeah. I saw cardboard, like flat pack cardboard desks. So these yep. people were on it instantly and selling them cheap and shipping them straight away. And it was like, well, you can't compete with that. So 
good on you. Go for it. Um, and it's so, it was so funny, all those stories that you'd hear about people investing in soap, people investing in, <laughs> in like, Zoom, you know, the, the online. I don't know about you guys, but my brain doesn't work like that. I don't see yeah. crisis, and, and, this, and I'm, not saying, I'm not trying to be sanctimonious when I say this, but I don't see crisis and go, oh, there's an investment there. No. You know, it's, I think some people are just that entrepreneur mindset and some people aren't. Well, I think there's different. I think there are entrepreneurs. Like we're we're all consider. I would say we're all entrepreneurs, but there's a different type, um, and it's just looking for the quick back, and that's the kind of yeah. entrepreneur that those people are, and good on them. But yeah, I just I just don't go there either. I mean, I would I would come up with that idea weeks after they'd already got something yeah. in the pipeline. <laughs> Weeks after Neil's got his mates with the Boeing yeah, or Airbus exactly. to fly yeah. it all over, and yeah, yeah, my my Boeing was busy that week, Robin. <laughs> yeah, oh, but it, like Jam at like Butter, I know they've had a real bumper year um, in mm. terms of oh, right. their flat pack stuff, and that's right. Um, he's done a lot of work developing that um, kit of parts range. I don't know if you've seen that on his Instagram with the threaded kind of yep. assembly of the. It's a very like, cool way. Eh? So he has put in big hours into making that work and is now reaping the rewards. So that's, that's really cool to see. Well, I've never seen, I don't know any other, I've never seen a flat pack. I mean, maybe Ikea does something, but I don't know like Ikea because we don't have it. But mm -hmm. having a flat pack wall unit like he's made, like it all just screws together, dowels screw together and you can kind of arrange it however you want. Um, that seems like a first of its kind as far as I know. Uh, yeah, uh, I haven't seen anything like it either. And the fact that you know that it's quality as well, like it's mm. been machined to an inch of its life. And um, yeah, yeah, it's really, really good to Pretty see. Cool. Just going through. So then we spoke to uh, Duncan Meerding. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, that was a that was a cool episode. I think Duncan just won some yeah, he some just major won a award, two couple of medals. Uh, yeah, a couple of um, yeah, what was it for? Well, something it was, really. It was <laughs> the Australian Aspire Awards, National Disability Achievement Awards. He won yeah. the Small yeah. Business Award and was semi-finalist for Best Achievement in the Arts, which is massive. phenomenal. Yeah, massive. It was so he cool. He just put up a picture on, on Instagram of a desk lamp. You know the, the traditional, it's normally a brass yep. stand with a with green, the green light? green glass, yep. yep. Yeah, except he's made it out of a wood log. That's, That's really so cool. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's straight after him. And, and this is something that, you know, we talk about getting guests on the show, and it's amazing to talk to these people. I think we hit the balance right this season of, of people's story and our story. Mm. And I hope to keep that because we did, um, uh, we talked to Duncan, and then the next week we talked to Damien Wright. And I right. remember the next week after that just being like, oh, there's so much to catch up on with the guys, but yeah. we just couldn't, we can't get through it because it's just, mm -hmm. you know, four weeks or whatever it is passes and it's like everything's changed. Yeah, that's a good point. Having the guests, for our sake, having the guests just makes uh, our podcast a lot more full, I guess. Mm. Yeah, because in season one, we were doing it every week. Yeah, and I remember at one point we just said, what are we going to talk about? We, yeah. Like, we aren't that exciting people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, after you get through all the classic tropes of woodworking um, podcasts, how to put finish on and how to sand a piece of wood, then you start saying, what are we actually talking about? But that's, what, that's when they get good, when you actually start talking about, you know, what's relevant uh, to us at the time. Speaking of which, what's, what's coming up? Because I just invented this awesome new thing process and um, I really want to share it but I'm not quite finished and um, I think it's going to be something cool going forward. Is this yeah. the a, um, a process? The leather, right. leather veneer? Yeah. So mm. Should you be talking about it this early? Have you, have, have you got the patents out? No. No. <laughs> well, let's, let's not get, get carried away. Um, so <laughs> you remember I did those uh, chairs, like 12 chairs had leather upholstery um, on them, mm. so I had a bit of leather left over, and I was sitting at Smoko looking at the roll, had like like three quarters of a hide sitting there, and I'm like, I really want to do something with that leather, and it's just, it's a shame that it's just sitting there, and I was and I was thinking, 
maybe I should just make a little trinket box or something and I could put like a leather top on the box because I didn't want to do anything with upholstery. I wanted to somehow make the leather part of the woodworking. Mm. Um, and I thought, ah, uh, box is a bit crap, like a bit too small. Like, no, it would be really cool to have leather drawer fronts. Uh, and then I thought, well, if I'm going to have drawers, I need to make a box. So uh, let's just make like a little nut, like a side table thing. And I just quickly, like in five minutes, came up with a sketch on the whiteboard. And I was like, bam, that's it. I'll make that. So essentially what I've got is, um, yeah, I'm, I made, I've made like this kind of really basic plywood box, put some three-way miters and mahogany around like a frame around the edge of it. And then so you end up with like a paneled box and those panels of glued on leather instead of like as a veneer to cover the panel and mm. it's so bloody cool but I, I, I've got to perfect how to do it I, I've run into a couple of issues because leather likes to stretch just a little bit so it's a pain in the ass um, does it move does does it expand and contract uh no not once it's glued in place but as you're fitting it like I what I did was say, say you've got a, a panel that's 500 by 500. I took a piece of plywood and cut it just the, the right size I wanted my leather. And then I just laid that piece of plywood on top of my leather and kind of traced around it with a knife to cut out exactly the shape I wanted. But as you lay it into the panel and you kind of squeegee it in place kind of, it just, just ever so slightly stretches and it's too big by like a millimeter. And then you've got to trim mm. it off, and then you've got to do something with that little edge that's not perfect. Um, Don't so you get I, like a, I'm sure I've seen uh, Jimmy DeResta where you get like a roller or something, and you basically yeah, like shampooing it, or softening. But that what edge. happens is the leather right at the edge pops up like that. I'm um, kind of, and so you can see it does. It's just not quite right. Um, anyway, like the whole look of it looks so cool, but I just need to perfect the process. And I can, I've already got this imagine, imagination of like a whole bedroom suite where you've got like a bed with leather panels, leather panel bed head. And it's just an, an accent where you can pretty much use any timber you like. But the infill, instead of painting it or instead of having an actual veneer board, you can put leather on it. And it's, it's such a cool look and it feels awesome. It's a perfect, it feels perfect for a bedroom where it's just slightly softer than um, you know, all timber or all paint or... Is that uh, different coloured leather or is it just the light? Uh, diff just the light. It's a really mm. difficult um, picture there. But also the leather I've got has got some um, imperfections on it, which is why I think the upholsterer didn't use it. And so there's mm. some scratches and mars scratch, and yeah. marks on it. But. And you wouldn't wrap the leather around the panel and then set the you, panel in. Yeah, you could do that. That's, I went through it in my head a few different variations of how to fit the leather panel, but there's, at some point you have to either mask off the leather or pre-finish the timber that is exposed mm. and then somehow apply the leather afterwards. And so it's just a matter of working out the process. But... I think there's, I think it's going to be a pretty cool thing. So that is what I'm like super excited about moving forward uh, in the new year. Um, I hopefully will have this piece I'm working on finished before Christmas. I'll put a video out on it. Mm. But um, don't just put like it out over Christmas. Don't don't do what you did with the staircase and put it out on. What what day did you put it, the staircase out on? It was like. Um, Oh, it was, the, it, was, it was the day of the election. The day of the election. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the bloody uh, Australian, uh, no, American election. watching YouTube, yeah. Yeah, well, that's a cool idea. Um, it's going to be sort of like um, Arthur with his straw marquetry, except yeah. Joey with his leather marquetry. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a whole lot of options with it. I think it will be, um, I think it'll be pretty cool. I just need to, like I say, work on the process. But I was really excited when I, like, was like, holy crap, I can use leather as a veneer. Like, surely mm. someone else has thought of it. I just haven't seen it. But, uh, yeah. yeah. How about you, Brian? Big plans for next year? Yeah, I've built up a reasonably decent queue now. I haven't been away oh, yeah? for a few months. Um, got a few dining tables to do, a few different designs. Um, one that is kind of going to be a bit more of an entry level piece. So, a bit less customization in it, or not less, but maybe 
it's going to be a simpler thing to customize than most of my pieces. Um, one fairly fancy, extremely large dining table, um, a big star map dining table. I was going to ask if the star map was going to come yeah, to Yeah, so it's, um, it's a couple and they want both their star maps kind of merged through the dining table. So that's going to be a big one. That's going to be one of the first things I get back to. And then I'm just starting... I've got a whole load of orders for end grain chopping boards. Oh, yeah? Um, after a chef that uses my boards did his cooking classes um, during the COVID lockdown. So people have been waiting oh, yeah. for those, and I'm just going to take some more pre-orders and try to do them in one big, large batch, which would well, be sort fun. of... Yeah, that would be a lot more profitable anyway than doing them the way I've been doing them for the last few years. Um, Quick side note, and not to get too far off topic, with your ahead. ingrained chopping boards, do you ever use um, Vic Ash or Tessie Oak? No, I haven't. I mean, I just worry about... Uh, boards, I just worry about open? water damage to them. Yeah, something, something um, more dense. It's pretty poor. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff. yeah, okay. Yeah, cool. I, would I, almost, tend to, I almost did a board with it not too long ago, and I looked at it, and I just thought, no, it's, I, it just doesn't feel right to turn this into a... And that's why. Yeah, you, I don't know. Like your cutting boards, uh, are they typically one or two designs, or are they all custom? So the the pixel boards that I do that have the two different colors in them, yeah. I either do I do one size, and it's either yeah. two colors, or you just have which is iron bark and black butt, yeah. or you just go all black butt. Yeah. And then I have a second design, which is a much larger iron bark board that is sort of aimed more at commercial kitchens, like right. It's massive and heavy and yeah, and not really for home use, but um, I got a couple of orders for those as well. I just asked because would you consider then, given you've only got, say, two or three SKUs, would you um, just spend a week a year and just make as many as you can in that week and then say, this is, this is the year, this is the year's batch? This is the stock for the year, yeah. L yeah number them, I... number them, create some demand for it and say, that's, how, that's it. Do you know one big issue that I have with that? Is, well, there's a bit of cost tied up in them because yeah. there is actually way more material in an engram board than yeah. most people think. Yeah. But also um, the stability issues. Mm. Like my workshop varies in temperature from midwinter to it's probably would get down to maybe minus two or mm. minus three, the coldest point, and then midsummer it'll get up to forty five to fifty somewhere in there on the hottest days. So. Engram boards do tend to move a lot in the heat, so I'd have to come up with a way of clamping them together or put them in a press something. or something. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just yeah. You, what you could do? I wonder. Um, you know what is it? Uh, um, uh, um, when they make when factories make um, billets for herringbone floors. Yep. You, uh, like a flooring company will make whatever you need a hundred square meters of herringbone um, little pieces. Yep. They make it in the factory when it's nice and dry. They're all cut at the same size, and then they're shrink wrapped up. And then oh, they, can't, right, okay. they can't take in moisture, and the moisture can't get out. They stay the, the right size. And then <laughs> when you get to site, you open it, and they say you once you open that pack, you've got to lay it like in that day or the next day. Uh, otherwise, they could change size, and you, you're going to have awful creeping issues with sizes as your hearing bone floor goes across because there's no tolerance. So hmm. surely you could. Um, you mean put like a finished board inside a big vacuum bag or something, and just well, yeah, or, or keep just all the like moisture um, out? pallet wrap. Mm -hmm. Just wrap them, wrap them in some pallet wrap as, as a bundle of ten or something. Yeah, um, yeah. And that would just, and then you could. Well, if it was me, I'd probably keep them at home under the bed or something until they yeah. sell, and then yeah, and, um, and then you've got them, and they, they shouldn't move if they're wrapped up. Yeah. I go through phases of actually going, oh, God, these are... Because they are, like, a pretty premium price point. Like, yeah. they start at 400 bucks, and for the yeah. two-tone one, it's 450 And that is with fairly minimal profit in them Yeah, I'd by be. the time they're finished pro properly. So I go through phases of going, oh, there's no point in this. There's no market in it. And then I'll get a flood of orders, and I'm like, oh, mm. maybe there is. So, yeah, I, um, so I'll see how many I actually get, get uh, pre-orders for, and I'll probably push that fairly heavily on social media and see if I can get up to maybe 20 to 30 boards and spend a good two weeks, maybe three weeks yeah. making them. Yeah. Um, yeah, just get some good podcasts on. Just yeah. 
Head down. Sand some Get the cash flow going. Work. Oh, a lot of end grain sanding. Oh. Yeah. Have but, you got a drum um, sander? I've got one, but I don't really put the... I use it prior to... So when I cross cut the, um, the end grain, I will feed them through the um, thicknesser yeah. to get them flat. So thicknesser, then cross cut them, and then um, I will put them through the drum sander as well just to get rid of any tear out at all. I, right. I just find that, especially with black, but the glue lines on them are so obvious unless you put them through the drum sander after mm. you've put them through the, the thicknesser. Right. But, um, <coughs> yeah, so that's that's my early year. A couple of coffee tables as well. So, yeah, enough to keep me busy, and I probably will end up working through a fair bit of the Christmas holidays, um, mm. which is just the reality. Like, I've had... And enforced You've had break from it, so yeah. yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of ready just to get back in and back into it. Yeah, hopefully the Melbourne weather uh, agrees with me and they don't throw any heat waves in this year. <laughs> um, but no, I'm saying. And another thing I was going to say, you know, about the positives and negatives of this year. Like obviously, the positives were uh, things like the death of Matt Blatt, which unfortunately appears to have reared its ugly head again. Um, Oh, really? They've been bought by Kogan, so um, more shit furniture, shit replica <laughs> furniture coming to a store near you, or at least online. So, um, But the um, Authentic Design Alliance, the guys that were lobbying the Australian government for copyright protection, I just saw today or yesterday, I think it was today, that um, there's now a 12-month grace period for any makers or furniture designers so you don't have to register your design. It's protected by 12 months if it's designed and made by your business in Australia, which is quite a cool thing because even if you like, if you get knocked off further down the line, fair enough, there's nothing you can do. But for all the product designers out there that have something, go to get it prototyped and it gets knocked off before they've even got their product to market, they now have a 12-month period where they are protected under Australian consumer law, which is it's shocking that it's taken this long to happen, but... <laughs> it's good. It's it's a good first step. But surely twelve months is surely twelve months is pretty. Um, I mean, you you don't you don't expect your profit margin to drop off. Well, oh, it can completely disappear because you do all the R and D in it. You do all the prototyping. Yeah. Like I know several people in Melbourne that have had prototypes made here. Then it goes to a factory in Southeast Asia. Somebody in the factory will basically steal the design and then it ends up being knocked off by um, your favourite big uh, DIY store in Australia that I won't name for legal reasons but like <laughs> it, it has happened multiple times um, there's also a yeah. German supermarket which I won't name, name for legal reasons in Australia <laughs> that has done the same thing so at least a 12 month grace period allows you some time if you're not intending on getting the design registered or patented, which is too expensive for most makers, to be honest, and it's it's quite a long, drawn out yeah, thing to do. It's not that easy. So it's not it's not something I would do because I don't feel it really impacts my bottom line because my pieces I feel are of a complexity that there's no profit in knocking my stuff off. Like there's yeah. way easier stuff that they can just CNC. Um, but, but I mean, yeah, more to from have the perspective of if. As I know 12 months is a, is a good step forward, but if I'm a maker and I make something uh, amazing and after 12 months someone steals my idea, I would be devastated. Because yeah, but now you don't even have... Not, like, up until now, you, you don't even have 12 months. Yeah, yeah, fair enough, yeah. So you have nothing, but at least you've got a 12-month period to maybe test an idea, mm. like, see how... You can bring it to market, see test how it performs, yeah. and then you can register it. Mm, and you've got, okay, and you've got right. legal protection, you. but it still baffles me that the Australian government still let all that replica shite still be shipped through ports. Mm. Like they don't allow counterfeit DVDs and and like yeah, right. other counterfeit products. But to say that furniture is fine and to stick it in the high street is not a problem <laughs> yeah. is just total bullshit. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you when you frame it like that, yeah, yeah. Yep. So, Robin, you had a couple of jobs coming up. 
Um, is that your focus mm. to get that done before Bubs is here? Or? Yeah, what are you yeah. going to... So that island bench, yeah, that I'm going to try and get done before the end of the year. It might stretch into the beginning of next. Um, I actually spoke to the client just today about trying to find casters. You right. guys talking about hardware not available. Yeah. This person wants it rolling and there's just no casters. Nothing online. Nothing that looks nice? Or is that what well, you mean? Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, sorry. No, you know, the, it's easy to get the industrial looking stuff with r red and blue wheels. Right. But, you know, you want something nice in your, in your home. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really hard to find casters. And I don't know if that's just because they don't make decorative casters mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. if it's a stock issue. Who are you? COVID. I mean, I know over here there are like four major caster, wheel caster industrial supplies, and they're, mm. they're mainly after the industrial market. So the mm. stuff they have, you will not find at a hardware store. But they've got, so there's a, a massive range, and yeah, there's a whole bunch of like blue and red urethane wheels, but then they've got these mm. ranges of like solid steel, ye olde looking cast iron wheels with okay. like modern bearings in them, and there's all sorts of stuff. I find you just got to dig on the internet and like it's, find the right key uh, keywords. Yeah, mm. and you'll it's find a lot of digging because a lot of these companies just don't have their search engine optimization no. done. And they don't they don't want your business. They want the guy who's going to order a thousand of one thing. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. A couple of the manufacturers so. that I did see, or the resellers, that you need an account. So right. you know, I would maybe try. Um, well, I'll give them a name drop. Sure, they've, they've always actually been quite easy to deal with. Uh, Richmond Casters. I, um, I saw them, yeah. Are they pretty the good? Yeah, they're open to public. Um, okay. So it's not only trade, but they have some... I've used the little twin wheel casters, which are about... I think they're about 80 kilo load each. Uh, yeah, and they're, and they're two very small ones yeah. right next to each other. I've seen those. So that was sort of the idea that I was going for to keep them minimal because the... Mm. The plate so that I want to put it on. They're needs. black wheels, but they're like a zinc plated or chrome mm. plated thing. I've just taken the wheel apart before and um, and etched and sprayed the the chrome black. Right. Oh, that's a good idea. I hadn't thought so, of that yeah. actually. Yeah, because yeah. I want my, my plate size is a bit of an issue because as well because I want quite a small plate. I mm -hmm. want to try and get it around a sixty by sixty. Mm -hmm. And then you're getting down to a, quite a small wheel, and yeah, it's way way harder to get casters than I thought it was going to be. I mean, have, a look at the, have a look at those twin casters because they're definitely, mm. you can get them way smaller than a 60 by 60 yeah. um, plate. So the other issue or the other thing you could do would be to go with the threaded rod option. Yeah, they have the single so, spindle versions of most, yeah. most of them have, have that option where you... So, so I'm nervous about doing that. So my edge sander, which I bought not too long ago, yep. is made of steel. Mm. It's a fairly thin steel. But it's got in the bottom. It's got four little holes for yeah. the feet, yeah. the rods mm -hmm. to come up. And I thought, ah, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll put some casters under there, <laughs> yeah. because of the way the casters shaped, the um, I don't know what ro I guess rotational force on that yeah. on that thread is massive. So Pops I just bent the all the steel underneath the, the yeah. sander. It just or they were just buckled. So my concern putting them on a on this this launch this this island is as they're rolling it. The force on the side walls of that wood is just going to bust them out. I mean, it's not. Yeah, no, no, it's not that big. They are made for it, but. Um, mm. I reckon option, I've had a 200, uh, maybe 150 kilo, island bench on those little twin casters before. With the rod, the, the plate. Using threaded rod. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to remember yeah, how I did it. I think I. It was either threaded inserts or. I might have epoxied in another mm. type of insert, like a hammer in insert, mm. and pinned it or something, but I wouldn't worry about that too much. I, like, your edge sander is going to be way heavier than your island bench, yeah. I would assume. Yeah, yeah. Even, oh, yeah, even yeah. with yeah. a bit of stone on the top, it's going to be fine. That, yeah. that stone, by the way, costs, because yeah. we talked about it last week being quite heavy, it's probably around 30 or 40 kilos. Oh, that's, it. that's not too bad. Nothing. Yeah. yeah, it's very a lot lighter than I thought it was going to be. I checked. And the actual material day. cost of that, Robin? Uh, what the stone? Yeah, not sure. Client supplying that. Not sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so that's the one project that I've got on the go. Um, as I've alluded to, but I still don't want to get into details. I am working on this this video deal right. at the moment. So yep. that's that's what I'm working on at the moment. Um, 
what else am I doing? I'm having a kid. I should probably bring that in <laughs> this conversation as well. Um, but then also, I wanted to really put some work into the podcast. So for mm-hmm. season three, we're gonna, you know, I want it to be a, a different show, a different feel, a different vibe. One of the things that I want to do is upstairs in my... So for everyone listening, you, you might not realize this, but I'm in my workshop. All the banging that you can hear going on on the water pipes above my head and the people <laughs> stepping over me. So I really want to get out of this workshop and move upstairs in, and work on some acoustic treatment in my office. I've got a better mic up there. Just I can improve yep. on the audio so much better. So I've got this really cool idea for what I want to do is make a massive acoustic panel for that room. Because the, the rooms upstairs have got high ceilings, mm-hmm. they are cavernous so the, mm-hmm. the 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 reverb up there is horrific so i want to make a big 1.8 wide by 1.2 acoustic panel and then maybe some smaller ones and i'm going to get my daughter and all of her friends around to just and just say here's some paint <laughs> there's a massive piece of canvas let's go to town let's go nuts <laughs> handprints footprints throw each other Jackson on it Pollock. Don't mind what it is, and then use that and wrap it around. You know the whole yeah. panel with the insulation wall and all that. Yeah. And and yeah, so that's I, I'm hoping that'll be one of the big one of the the first videos. That'd be cool. Of next year, I think it'll just be quite a nice a nice. It's a sim- simple concept, but I haven't seen anyone do very big panels before. Yeah. So yeah, you know, often they're like um, uh, modular. They, often the companies will make real, relatively small panels that are modular and you can just kind of mm. tile them wherever you want. Um, in the I DIY th- version, you use the bats, which I've got, mm-hmm. the installation bats, and you generally make it to fit a bat, right. which is right. uh, like 12, what's it? Is it a 1,200 meter? long, 500 wide sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, that's pretty much it. So. Cool. Um, that's all right. I, mean, I, I thought, I thought for a second there when you were saying about a new look for season three, I thought Joey and I were getting our marching yeah, orders there say, for what, a second. New hosts. I was sweating. Was like, oh, Jesus. New hosts, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no I, think it's, I think it's been a very cool season. I'm glad we got... I still remember the conversation that Joey and I had about, yeah, look, the two of us, this isn't working. We need a, th- we need a number three. Yeah. And um, just going through, who do we get? Who do we get? Um, and I didn't actually know you, Brian, at the time. I didn't... I hadn't, very little idea. I, I, Joey, I, I can't remember what your connection was with Brian. I feel like we had talked before, Brian, somehow. Oh, you interviewed me years ago, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, of yeah. course, that's why. You were on the podcast. But yeah. I didn't keep contact after that. Uh, that, okay. was, yeah. that was it, yeah. I think maybe me and Brian shared a few uh, direct messages here and there. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think I was just like, hey, I think it was pretty out of the blue. I think I just said, do you want to be the host on, on the podcast? No, it's been really great. I love, you know, I love catching up with you guys. Like, like I say to everyone, it's just most of us work alone during the day. Um, so it's really nice just to have a connection with a couple of other makers and be able to get other guests on and, and chat and feel as though you're part of a community. And, and, we've, and we've got that right this episode. We have improved that community. Um, you know, as I was saying earlier with, with uh, Jim from um, uh, Like Butter, there's a guy that I can now go to and talk to. Mm-hmm. We've, we've pulled people in. And there's a lot of podcasts out there who don't interview people. And there's a, lot yeah. of, there's a lot of worth in that because I know personally when I watch YouTube videos or, or listen to podcasts, we were talking about personality last week. When I watch a, a YouTube video and someone else comes on the show, I go, Ugh, I, don't, I don't want this other person. I want, <laughs> yeah. I want, I want my normal yeah, but then at the same time, it's so much value in another sense as well. So I'm glad we decided to go this route, and definitely we'll we'll do it next season as well. Yep. Mm. Okay, so cool. I guess that's us, huh? That's it. All right. So to everyone listening, hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please go ahead and give it a rating on iTunes. That really does help us out. Shop Store Podcast is available on iTunes and most other podcast apps. My name is Robin Lewis, Joey and Brian. Thanks for hanging out for the last time for season two and the last time for 2020. Oh, it's been great. Hope you guys have a lovely summer break and good luck with the new baby. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to come back for Sometimes. season three and I'm just going to be, hey guys, it's Robin. 
It's yeah. a pie shop so far, guys. <laughs> He's like, we've got to make this quick. I've got five minutes. <laughs> Just crying babies in the back. At least he can't. At least he can't lose any more hair, Robin. It's fine. <laughs> That's You're sorted. Exactly. Uh, all right, cool. Yeah. yeah. All right, everyone. All thanks for tuning in. See you. See, see you. you next season. See you. Twenty-one.